برنامه اینان گل سرخ نگاه میکنید مجله اجتماعی سیاسی که به زبانهای انگلیسی و فارسی روی کانال جدید پخش میشه سلام به همگی من مریم نمازی هم و من فریبوز پویا هستم در برنامه این هفته مصاحبه ای داریم با دیاخان کارگردان و تهیه کننده بر... فیلم در رابطه با قتل های ناموسی در زم در رابطه با بحران مهاجرتی در اروپا صحبت خواهیم کرد و کمیته های خوش آمدگویی که به وجود اومدن و در زم فتوا علیه سکیت با چرخدار دور کعبه با ما باشید بر مبنای تخمین های محافظ کارانه سازمان ملل هر سال پنج هزار زن و دختر توسط اعضای خانواده خود که اغلب پدر، برادر، اموها و گاهن مادران آنها هستند کشته می شوند قتل ناموسی معمولا با طرح و برنامه ریزی از پیش تعیین شده با هدف بازپسگیری ناموسی یک خانواده اجرا می شود. پاکسازی شرم که ظاهرا یک زن یا دختر برای خانواده برمغان آورده است با از بین بردن وجود او به دست می آید. واضح است که هیچ افتخاری در قتل وجود ندارد. چیزی که خیلی مشخصه دختران و زنایی که کشته می شن می گن که شرم آوردن به خانواده ولی واقعیتش اینه که با هر ارزش انسانی که بهش نگاه میکنیم شرم آور اون کاریه که اون پدره یا عموه انجام داده یه آدم کشته به هر دلیلی باشه قابل قبول نیست و این خیلی این مسئله فکر کنم توی خط و خواهر میانه و شمال آفریقا هم به یک مشکل اجتماعی شناخته شده و جامعه داره اکس به این قضیه نشون میده دولت ها نه سازمان ها نه دستگاه های مذهبی نه بلکه خود جامعه جوان اینو قبول نداره دیگه و داره تلاش میکنه که این لکه واقعا ناراحت کننده و عقب مونده از جامعه جوامع بردارن یه مشکلی که وجود داره اینه که توی خیلی از قوانین کسی که قتل ناموسی انجام میده خیلی اوقات یا آزاد میشه یا مثلا یک برای مدت خیلی کوتاهی زندانی میشه انگار که کار زیاد مثلا بزرگی انجام نداده آره قوانین به نفع کسایی که در واقع مورد در واقع جرم قرار گرفتن به نفع اونا نیست همیشه در دفاع اون روابط عقب مونده است یه مشکل دیگه هم که وجود داره اینه که توی کشورهای اروپایی توی 20 30 سال گذشته که نیروهای اسلامی و نیروهای مذهبی قوی شدن جامعه اروپا سعی کرده به این قضیه زیاد دست نزنه بخواد که مسئله خصوصی مسئله خوا... گروه های جامعه هستند ولی این موج داره برمیگرده و کاملا با فعالیت های گروه های خیلی زیادی که در واقع بخشین خونشون به جوش اومده این قضیه داره برمیگرده مثلا نگاه میکنیم تو خود اروپا تو خود انگلیس برای مثال یازده هزار جرم ناموسی صورت گرفته توی طی سه سال یعنی واقعا تعدادش خیلی زیاده و یکی از کسایی که فعالیت کرده علیه قتل های ناموسی دیاخانه که یه فیلم خیلی قشنگی درست کرده که فقط جایزن برده ما یه قطعه کوتاهی از این فیلم براتون نشون میدیم در حالتا قتل ناموسی یک زن جوان به اسم بناز محم... محمود و بعدش هم یه مصاحبه خیلی عالی داریم با دیا حتما با ما باشید و اینو نگاه کنید She loved to see people happy. She did not like arguments. She didn't want people raising their voice. She hated it. She just wanted a happy life. She wanted, you know, a family. And I'm wondering if you all want to speak. Who killed Banaz? You're innocent, then who killed Banaz? Who killed Banaz? People following me, or still now they follow me. At any time, if anything happens to me, it's them. They killed her there just just for for being in love. I mean, sometimes I am thinking why love should be so hated. If she was in my life, my life would be orange and yellow.
Dia. It's a pleasure having you on our program. I wanted to ask you about Banal's A Love Story. It's a film that really had a huge effect on me, and I think a lot of people. How did you feel making it? It was, the, the story had a huge impact on me as well. Um, when I first started out making, uh, uh, when I first started out, I wanted to make a documentary about honor killings. And the reason I wanted to make the, 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 a documentary about that is I wanted people to understand what it really is, what all the dynamics are, um, in order for people to then react to it appropriately. So people, whether it's the police, whether it's the education system, whether it's the health services, anyone on the front lines in a position to help young people at risk, for them to understand better what it is. So I wanted to create this sort of help tool, educational tool for them. And when I first started out, I was uh, actually going to cover several stories. And one of the stories was Banaza's story. And I remember the more I started reading about her, the more I started looking into her case, I just realized that this was the story that I wanted to tell throughout the film. And the reason for that, because actually a lot of my friends and a lot of people have asked me, you know, is it because her story is more brutal than any of the others? Is it because it's more violent, more vicious? And the answer is no, they're all really brutal. They're all really violent and vicious and up close and personal. The reason I chose Banaz is in her story, you, it, it contains all the lessons that we need to learn. But it also, and, and highlights all the problems and all the failures in the system uh, which contributed to her death. But also it, it contains a part of the solution. And the part of the solution is this woman, Caroline Good, who investigated her case. As much as Banaz was let down in her life by the police, after her death, she was found by this, this woman. And the reason I'm calling her a part of the solution is this woman, this police officer, cared about this girl beyond in her capacity as a police officer. She said that one of the first times that I met Caroline, uh, I was doing research interviews, and we finished, she sort of gave me this very, um, very sort of formal police interview and, you know, explaining, you know, the investigation was like this and then we did this and we did that. And then when we finished, uh, I said to her, I said, yeah, but why did you care so much? You didn't really have to go to Iraq and secure the first ever extradition. You didn't have to go to the, to the lengths that you went to. You could have just taken your pat on the back and case closed and you're done. And she murmured, she said, well, you know, it's because I love her. And I just went, what do you mean you love her? She said, well, you know, I just feel like, you know, she should be loved and, and someone should love her and her family should have and they didn't. And so I should, so I do. And I, I just choked up and I, I just realized this is the story I want to tell. I mean, I get goosebumps even thinking about it. This is the story I want to tell. I want to tell not just the horror story, but I also want to tell the love story, not the obvious one of the, the man that Banas fell in love with, but, the, but this one of this white woman, who police officer who's never met this kid in her life who can so desperately, deeply care and love about this, love this young girl, that's what we need. To me, that's the solution to everything that we're, we're, you know, we all care about, is for people to care. Because once you care, you take action. Once you care, you can change the world. Once you care, you can take on such horrifically difficult um, uh, issues like this. And because I wanted, I wanted there to be a window of possibility. I didn't want people to watch the film or to hear about these types of cases and think, well, there's nothing we can do. Or sit in some kind of self-righteous, kind of moral, morally indignant sort of position of, well, this is just what those people do, just let them get on with it, let them kill each other. But for people to really sit down and feel, actually, no, these young women, these young people are ours, all of ours, whether we're white, whether we're brown, whether we're whatever we are, there are kids and we all have a responsibility to care for them and to be there for them and to do our part. And this woman, Caroline, sort of exemplifies that. And so that's, to me, it's so important to not just, in, my, in the work that I'm doing anyway, is to show the problems, is to ask the difficult questions, but then also allow for the space where possibility of solutions can, can, can happen. Tell us a bit about Banaz exactly, because also one, I think, strength of her story is also her resistance to this all, her trying to get help throughout. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the thing about Banaz is that, well, just a very brief background on her life. She was born uh, in Iraq, 
uh, in the Kurdish region, uh, region of Iraq, um, her, uh, her and all of her sisters were cut uh, by their grandmother as children, uh, as a female genital mutilation as children. At the age of about 10, her and her family uh, moved to Britain and settled in South London. Came from a very traditional, a fairly strict family, and um, at the around age of about 17, um, the family found a husband for her, and this husband was 10 years older than her, was brought straight from, from back home. Um, so in terms of compatibility, very, very little. Um, she agreed to the marriage, as, as much as a 17-year-old can agree to a marriage to a stranger. Um, this man was very violent, he was very brutal, he beat her, he raped her, raped her uh, which she tried to keep a secret from the family for quite a long time. Then eventually when she couldn't take it anymore, she, she told her family and said that she wanted to leave. And her family's response was, you need to try harder to be a better wife to this man and you need to go back, in fact, and, and, and do your job as a wife. And she did. She did go back and she continued to try and eventually she couldn't take it anymore. And she said, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to do this. Um, she left, went back to the family home, lived with the parents and started the process of rebuilding her life. And in, in, in this process of, of rebuilding her life, she also fell in love with somebody. Um, this, the, the extended family found out about and very quickly started making plans to, to stop this. Um, and what we know now is that there was a meeting that took place in, uh, in their grandmother's house in South London in December. Um, and by the end of January, she was killed. Um, now, the, the sort of added tragedy for me in this is that while she was alive, Banaz went to the police five times asking for help, five different times saying, this is what's going to happen to me. I need help, what can I do? And the fact that she was turned back every single time, other than I think the very last time, um, the woman said, it sounds to me like you're in a, the police officer said, it sounds to me like you're in a very serious situation, you need to come back. Uh, you need to stay here and not go back to the family. She said, I'll be back tomorrow because my mum's at home and my mum's not gonna let anything happen to me. And she never came back because they killed her that night. Um, so to me, you know, not only was Banaz betrayed by her family and, and then by the silence of the wider community who knew about what had happened to her and never said anything, but also the fact that the society that she lived in, the society that promises us equal rights, equal opportunities, but also equal protection, doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter what you look like and what background or family you come from, you, are, you deserve justice, you deserve protection. The fact that none of that was available to her in Britain today is unacceptable. Uh, and, and that betrayal, is, it's, just, it's just devastating. And so that's the part of the, the story that's very important to me in the sense of those are the lessons that we need to learn and the lessons are that when a woman comes and asks her, the thing is Banaz did everything right you know very often uh, authorities say that when it comes to either domestic violence cases or forced marriage cases or any kind of violent uh, or, or abusive uh, cases when it comes to women most women don't want to come forward and ask for help or most people most women don't come and report it she did she did everything we're told we should do if we're in trouble, and still there's no help. I mean, on one occasion, one of the police officers said that she was just being hysterical and just being overdramatic, and actually went to her father, went to Banaz's father, and said, she's trying to raise a complaint against you. And I, I believe that surely that must have accelerated the, the process and the plans that the family are, were already considering. And it's, you know, to me, our young people are on one hand restricted and suffocating within their own communities or their families and on the other hand they are not heard, they're not seen and they're not included and treated as if they are a part of British society fully either. And so I think many of our young people find themselves caught in this very, in, in the sort of no man's land and, and it also makes it I think very difficult for some young people and young women especially to leave abusive relationships because this is, they are afraid of stories like Panas as well because they worry that if I go out will somebody believe me, will somebody even understand that this does happen and this is real for me. Yes.
one final final question will have to be how can we change this you know from Iran to Iraq to Britain and elsewhere you know all change comes from ourselves so I think each each and every one of us as individuals, I think there's a lot we can do. And some of the things that we can do is, you know, issues like honor killings. It's not happening for the health of the family. The family is doing it because they are wanting to save face, not for themselves, but for us. There's a reason why these killings happen because they're trying to impress or trying to give us, the broader community, a message. So I think, all of us have to make it, uh, we have to make it very clear what we really think about it. Um, and we have to make a decision. What do we really want for our young people? What do we want for our future? Do we want for our future to suffocate all talent, all dreams, all choices, all true expression of our young people and our children? Is that the kind of stinted development and, and therefore stinted societies that we want? Or do we want to encourage and build and support healthy, flourishing, happy, loving, caring, safe, sane children? And I think, you know, as families, rather than, rather than gaining honor from murdering your child, surely your honor should become greater and respected for being a good father, for being a good mother and a good brother, rather than the brother and the father who murders the woman in their family. That's not honorable, that's not manly, that's nothing. That's nothing. We are exterminating. We are cutting the legs off our own people, our own futures, by doing this. Banaz should have still been here. The world, Britain, need, and, and the, the Kurdish community, Muslim community, whichever community, they need people like Banaz in them. We need our children to be alive. We don't need our children to go to jihad and die. We don't need our children to be murdered by their own parents and their own families. We don't need our women to be murdered by, or beaten and abused and violated by their husbands. We need, this is why our societies are not working, is because we are destroying the very essence of what our future is, which is our young people. It's our women, it's our daughters and sons. And we need them alive. We don't need them to die in the name of religion or in the name of culture or in the name of honor. We need them here with us. So that's what we can do, is as neighbors, as community members, as uncles, as aunts, as sisters, as mothers and brothers, we can all take a stand. And we can all say that no, this is not the future that we want. We want a future that includes all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you. اخبار شوکه آور این هفته مجددا در رابطه با بحران پناهندگی در اروپا است و یه عکسی تازگی منتشر شده از یک بچه به اسم آلان کردانی که جسد کوچیکش روی ساحلی در ترکیه دیده میشه و داستان این بچه اینه که اونو مادر و پدرش و برادرش با هم داشتن سعی میکردن با کشتی بیان با یه قایق بیان به یه جای امتری برسن و مادر و دو تا بچه در حین سفر میمیرن قرق میشن دقیقا این عکس فکر کنم تمام انسانیت دنیا رو تکون داد وقتی از یه زاویه پای بچه رو میبینی که کفش کوچولوش باشه و واقعا بدون هیچ جرمی جانش رو از دست داده تو این شرایط تمام دنیا رو به, به شک وادار کرد و تمام تصویر وارانهی رو که از مسئله پناهندگی توی دنیا تلاش میکردن نشون بدن که اینا مهاجران هستن، جنایتکارن، نباید کشورهای اروپا بیان، همون کشورهای خودشون بمونن و ما تو این برنامه خیلی تلاش کردیم بگیم که این ما این مهاجران بهترین های این جامعه هستن این تاثیر رو به هم زد و چیزی که خب بعضیا میگن که خب خیلی کشته شدن خیلی دارن میان چرا این عکس انقدر اهمیت داره به نظرم اهمیت این عکس اینه که 
میدونی میره خارج از آمار و ارقام و میاد یه چهره انسانی هم تراژدی که برای خیلی ها وجود داره و اینکه چقدر میدونی اینا آدم های بچه مثل بچه های خودمونن میتونه بچه هر کسی باشه که اینو میبینه و خیلی ها را دیدم که گفتن که این عکسو دیدن همونجا توی قطار هر جایی که بودن فقط میتونستن گریه کنن و این تمام کودکانی که الان توی پروسه پناهندگی هستن از توی مرز سوریه، مرز عراق، مرز ایران، مرز پاکستان، مرز افغانستان شمال آفریقا دارن تلاش میکنن بیرسن هزاران و حتی ملیون ها کودک هستن تو همین شرایط هم بدنان این اتفاق داره سرش میاد باید جلو این گرفته بشه و فکرم جامعه جهانی یک لحظه به خودش اومد و تصویر متفاوت رو داره نشون میده از. وقتی که این عکس دیدم به فکر خانواده خودم افتادم که بالاخره مادر پدرم از ایران فرار کردن اومدن که یه زندگی بهتری برای من و خواهرم به وجود بیارن و خب متاسفانه این پدری که فقط تنها مونده و واقعا غمی که داره به نظرم مثلا نمیشه حرفش رو زد سخن ازش گفت و میبینیم که این آرزویی که برای بچه‌هاش داشت از بین رفته ولی خب باید این تراژدی یک و, و میشه دید که یک جنب و جوشی بده برای تغییر راهی رفتاری که به پناهندگان میشه توی جهان در هندوستان دو تا خواهر که از کاست پایینن گروه های اجتماعی که در هند وجود دارن یک مثل یک دادگاه قبیله‌ای به نوعی توی یه دهکده تو هند تصمیم گرفتی که این دو تا خواهر بعد بهشون تجاوز بشه به خاطر اینکه برادرشون رفته با یک زنی که از یک کاست بالاتر هست ازدواج کرده و گفتن که بی شرمی نشون دادن به خانواده بالاتر و به همین دلیل باید شرم این خانواده پایینتر که دختراشونن رو ازشون بگیرن و توی ملای عام لخت اینا رو بیارن و بهشون تجاوز بکنن آدم بعضی وقتا فهم میکنه که اینا حتی اگه داستان های عجیب غریب هم بخوای بسازی این آدم فکرش نمیرسه که به این واقعیت نابرابری که توی و وحشتناکی توی هند وجود داره رو بهش برسه و چینی داستانی بسازه و به خود قابل تصور این چیز بعد چیزی که اینجا واقعا نشون دهنده موقعیت زنه توی همه جوامع واقعا وقتی نگاه می‌کنیم به خصوص جوامعی که عقب مونده است جوامعی که زن به عنوان مثلا مال خانواده یا مرد محسوب میشه مثلا این برادرش رفته این ناش... مثلا کار ضد ناموسشون انجام داده خواهران که باید بهشون تجاوز بشه این نابرابری رو میشه دید و موضوع برنامه‌ای هم که امروز داریم کاملا چیز کاملا رب داره هیچ هیچ چیزی اونجا نیست که از این دختر دو تا دختر دفاع بکنه از حقوق اینا دفاع کنه فقط اعتراضی که میتونه و پجارو کردن این سیستم کاست و این اوکی میشه انجام داد به نظر من فقط با اعتراض این کار دقیقا میشونه. یعنی چیزی که هست اتفاقا این دخترا و خانوادهشون رفتن پلیس پلیس بهشون توجه نکرد الان رفتن و مخفی هستن و رفتن اعتراض خودشون رو به دادگاه عالی هند اعمال کردن و این به خاطر اعتراضات که تا الان محفوظن و این اعتراضات بعد ادامه پیدا کنه فتفای احمقانه و دیوانه این هفته در رابطه با اینه که فیلم یه نفر رو گرفتن توی دور کعبه توی مکه داره با رول بلد از این توالت چرخش شده با چرخ اینجوری با خیلی راحت داره دور میزنه و اعتراض کردن که یه فتوا در این مورد لازمه که کسی اجازه نداشته باشه با چرخ و خیلی راحت دور کعبه چیز کنه و خیلی جالب اینجاست که همه خیلی کسایی که نگرانن فتوا میخوان میگن سری بعد فتوا بدیم به خاطر اینکه قرار نیست که آدما راه نرن بعد بر را برن زج بکشن که بفهمن و فقط به فکر خدا باشن نه حال کنن با رولر اسکیت سری بخوام برن حرفا و اگه لازمه یک چندین روز را برن برن به شیطان سنگ بزنن از این کارا بکنن یکی هم میم اسد باید سوال بکنه که واسن این کار احمقانه دوری سنگ سیاه یا کعبه دور دور زدن برای یه هفته و از این بغل رؤسای شاههای عربستان سعودی پولا رو دارن جمع میکنن اینو یه فکری در موردش بکنیم واقعا 
میشه در تو این فتوه ها چیزی, چیزی, چیزی غیر از این که واقعا احمقانه هستن ولی به نظر اگر قرار کار این چنینی آدم انجام بده بره دوره یه سنگ خودش را بره بره دورش چند بار خب حداقل با رولر اسکیت بره که یه حالی هم بکنه اون وسط یه کایت از این دور بزنم با کایت برم بهتر نیست کایت چیه؟ از اینا که بال میزنن دور میزنن راحتره نه این دور راحتر نیست نه بر حال این فتوای احمقانه این هفته ما در رابطه با کعبه و دیوانگی دور کعبه بود این عکس واقعا عکس خیلی گویایی از یک پناهنده فلسطینی که از سوریه فرار کرده در لبنان داره سعی میکنه خودکار بفروشه که بتونه زندگیشو فراهم کنه و این عکس رو یک،, یک کسی توی آیسلند دیده و سریعا یک کمپین کمک مالی برای این شخص شروع کرده و طی چند روز 181 هزار دلار جمع شده این شخص هم پیدا کردن اسمش از عبدالحلیم آتار و اینو که فهمیده انقدر دیگه باعث دلگرمی شده که گفته که میخواد یک برنامه درست کنه برای آموزش بچه های پناهنده سوری دوباره یه لحظه روابط و همبستگی جامعه خودشون نشون میده دقیقا تقریبا این همین اتفاق هم یه خانواده سوئدی رفته بودن یونان به عنوان برای تحتیل ها تابستونیشون شنیدن یه آنمه پناهنده اونجا تازه اومدن یا باراش نبل کردن یه آنمه رفتن برای پناهنده ها غذا و آب و کمک و لباس و این چیزا بردن اینا این هم بستگی انسانی رو میشه تو تمام این لحظه ها دید و آدم ها میخواین کار کنن باید در و امکان برای هم بستگی مردم و انسانی رو باید باز کرد و فراهم کرد امکان پذیره تصویر همبستگی مردم و که اعلام کردن که پناهندگان جای قدمشون روی چشم ما تو مونیخ تو شهرهای دیگه و کشورهای دیگه تو اروپا همه جا شروع کردن در رابطه با این صحبت کردن که خیر مقدم گفتم به پناهندگان تو و با آغوش باز از این خبر بهتر می شدید و واقعا جالبه یعنی اصلا تعداد کسایی که اومدن کمک کنن قضا بدن، پناهنده رو ببرن خونه خودشون، کمک کنن، خوش آمدگویی بگن بگن که جای جاشون گرم، جاشون اینجاست میدونین خیلی واقعا دلگرم کننده است به خصوص با تبلیغات ضد پناهندگی که هی دولت ها حسن میکردن به چپونن تو حلق مردم معلومه که انسانیت مردم خیلی بزرگتر از این حرف هاست این تصویر رو که آدم میتونه میبینه که یه بچه توی مونیخ باشده میگه ویلکام خوش آمد. من خوش آمد. آره توی انگلیس اصلا تمام روزنامه ها رو نگاه میکنی همه دارن صحبت از میکنن کمپین های مختلف تا دو هفته پیش تمام این یه عالم از روزنامه ها تلاش میکردن که فرض کن پنندگاه که توی بندر کله هستن بین فرانسه و انگلیس رو سعی میکنن اینا رو به عنوان قاچاقچی مجرم چیز کنن الان تمام همه دارن کمپین های متفاوت کمک به پنندگان توی کله و باز کردن راه و چیزی که مهمه که تو این وسط هم مرزا برداشته بشه هیچ دلیلی وجود نداره که آدمایی که دارن در زندگی میخوان دربرن از وضعیت چون با مرز و پلیس رو روشن و انسانیت این مرزا داره باز میکنه و تنها چیزی که میتونه مرزا رو واقعا باز کنه این رابطه و همبستگی انسانیه که یک لحظه یه دنیای متفاوت رو به دنیا نشون داد بله یعنی یک واقعیت اینه که این این نوع همبستگی رو همیشه توی دورانی که واقعا فجایع تراژدی خیلی اسفناکی صورت میگیره انسانیت آدما واقعا میاد جلو و واقعا دل، باعث دلگرمی همه است به هر حال رسیدیم به انتهای برنامه‌مون امیدوارم از این برنامه خوشتون اومده باشه میخواستم بهتون یادآوری کنم که ما یک پیامگیر داریم شماره شو در آخر برنامه میبینید و پایین صفحه حتما پیاماتون و حرفایی که دارین رو میتونین روی پیامگیرمون بذارین و ما سعی خواهیم کرد که چند تا از پیاماتون رو در حین برنامه من بذاریم که بقیه شنوندگان عزیز بشنون با, با این خاتمه از طرف من و مریم نمازی تو هفته آینده روز و شب خوبی داشته باشین
Hi, I'm Mariam Namazi. And I'm Fadi Bospuya. We're hosting a program called Bread and Roses. It's a weekly program that's broadcast in Persian and English in the Middle East and North Africa, primarily Iran as well. And it's also shown on YouTube internationally. And we've been doing this since last May. We're coming up to our year's anniversary. And yeah. we, we've had quite a lot of fun making these videos. We discuss taboo-breaking, free-thinking ideas. The Islamic regime of Iran has called us immoral and corrupt. And that's why the, you need to support us. We are and the vo alternative voice in Middle East and North Africa. Of corruption and immorality. So do support us. Here's a short video from Patreon that explains how you can help us with even just one dollar a week. That's nothing. Support us. Patreon lets fans become patrons of their favorite artists and content creators. It's different than Kickstarter because it's not about one big project that requires lots of funding. It's more for bloggers or YouTubers or webcomics, anyone who creates on a regular basis. Here's how it works. When you become a patron, you're agreeing to give an artist a tip of an amount you set every time they release a piece of content, whether it's a new song, a video, or a recipe. You can set a monthly maximum to make sure that you're always within your budget. Choose an amount, enter your payment information, and you're done. Becoming a patron allows you to view and post in the artist's stream. And in exchange for your support, artists offer additional patron packages, which might include monthly Google Hangouts, music production tutorials, pre-sale concert tickets, or anything they can offer as a way to say thanks. Patreon, empowering a new generation of content creators.